Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and help us out on Patreon if you can. We appreciate you. Today's lesson will look at hydrogen and hydrocarbon rocket fuels, and why methane might not be the only or even best choice for a first date. Carbon is a unique element in our universe. To understand why it requires just a little chemistry. Here is a periodic table. Here are what is called the noble gases. Named so because they were too snobby to mix with the others. The lightest is helium, then neon and argon. These are very common on most planets. Neon is used in lights here on Earth and has been detected in the extremely tenuous atmosphere of the moon. Next is argon, and it is the third most abundant gas in our air here on Earth, after nitrogen and oxygen. Argon is almost 1% of Earth's atmosphere. 1% of Earth's atmospheric pressure is the entire atmospheric pressure on Mars. The atmosphere on Mars is mostly carbon dioxide, almost 96% in fact followed by nitrogen and these trace gases. But the next most abundant gas is argon. Argon is almost 2% of the thin Martian atmosphere. It turns out that noble gases like argon are very easy to ionize. By knocking off an electron, we give the atom a positive charge. That lets us use electromagnetic fields to throw the atom out the back of our rocket at very high speeds. This makes argon a possible propellant source for ion engines leaving the orbit of the Earth or Mars. We see that argon is atomic number 18 on the periodic table. Atomic number describes the number of protons in an element, and the number of protons determines what an element is. Down here is the atomic mass, and it tells you how many neutrons are in the nucleus on average. Argon has an average atomic mass of almost 40 telling us that the most common isotope of this element, and the number of neutrons determines the isotope, has 18 protons and 22 neutrons, to give us an atomic mass of 40. Because ion engines throw propellant at a certain velocity, we get better performance with heavier noble gases, like xenon, used in the New Horizons or Deep Space One ion engines, or krypton, used in the SpaceX Starlink satellites. But these are rare gases, okay for little satellites, probably not best for large rocket systems. Argon might work out to be a better choice for large ships despite its lower mass. Going over here we see elements that easily lose an electron to gain a plus one charge. These elements can also be used in ion engines, but they tend to be solids and are harder to work with. If you watch this lesson on ion engines, you will know all about the different types. The atoms way over here will easily gain an electron. Two of them can share electrons in a covalent bond, but if they encounter an element that will easily give up an electron, like these over here, they might just completely take it and have a negative charge. When this happens, these two elements will usually combine together into ionic compounds like salt, which is sodium chloride. Going back to column two, these can lose two electrons and have a charge of plus two. One of these can combine with two of these to become, for instance, calcium chloride. Again, this is an ionic bond, where one atom completely gains an electron, becoming completely negatively charged, and the other has completely lost two electrons, making it completely positive with a charge of plus two, or if it just loses one, plus one. These charges make them stick together like magnets. Elements in the same row have similar behaviors, and as you go down the rows, the atoms get bigger. After the Big Bang, the entire universe was mainly hydrogen with a little helium and a tiny fraction of lithium. All elements past these first three elements are created by other stellar processes like supernovas. If we show how many electrons an element likes to lose, share, or give up as sticks, we can see that there is a pattern that forms. Working from the ends toward the center, we get one, two, three, and finally four. Here at carbon. Carbon can form four strong covalent bonds, so this row can make more stable connections with other atoms than any other row under common conditions. Carbon is the most versatile 
and can take part in the construction of complex molecules necessary for life. These few elements here are mostly what makes up life on Earth. And that is why we and all life on Earth are carbon-based life forms. Moving down the periodic table, we again get larger and larger atoms. Silicon can make four stable bonds also, and it has been theorized as a possible source of life. But while carbon dioxide is a gas at standard Earth temperature, silicon dioxide is a solid. This and the bulkiness of silicon make it less likely to be the main atom in any life form that has access to carbon, except at extreme temperatures. If any life forms exist at super high temperatures, they might be silicon based, as the weaker carbon bonds might be too unstable. We have ignored these elements down here. These elements can very easily share electrons with each other and become the usually shiny materials we call metals. These are necessary for life in small quantities, acting as catalysts and carrier atoms like the iron and hemoglobin. But carbon can still form more complex molecules than any other element. Carbon can combine with hydrogen, forming what we call hydrocarbons. These carbons can form into long chains, very long chains actually. Our cells use a modified form of these to make its bilayer membrane, and they are stored in our body as fat. When it comes to molecules that burn easily with oxygen, hardly anything beats hydrocarbons. The simplest hydrocarbon is methane. Methane has one carbon and four hydrogens. The next simplest is ethane with two carbons and six hydrogens. But as you can see, if we burn these with oxygen, breaking these bonds to form water and carbon dioxide, we get more of these carbon-hydrogen bonds per atom of carbon in methane than we do with ethane. This helps methane burn cleaner. Ethane is, however, denser, and as these carbon chains get longer, they start to interact together along their length. So the longer a hydrocarbon is, the more the molecules stick together, and the easier they are to become liquids at higher temperatures. Methane must be brought down to around 73 Kelvin, or about minus 200 to be a liquid. And it must be pressurized. If allowed to expand, it would become a gas again. While the denser hydrocarbons will be liquid at higher temperatures. Denser gases and liquids have more kilograms per cubic meter. That allows us to move more kilograms per second through a pump as it spins. Liquefied natural gas is mostly methane. About 85% in fact. The rest of the gas is ethane, propane, and butane. These have two, three, and four carbon atoms in the chain, respectively. These could also be purified, and in fact are. While ethane is not commonly used, propane and butane are used in tanks for heating systems, generators, and gas stoves. Since they are longer hydrocarbon molecules, they can be stored at higher temperatures and lower pressures. And since these still burn very clean, we could run a reusable rocket on these. But it can take a much higher ignition temperature to start them burning. Here we see the energy content of these different fuels. I've added hydrogen for comparison, but it is not a hydrocarbon. You can see that nothing beats hydrogen for energy per unit mass. But if we look at density, we see that we will need to pump a huge volume of liquid hydrogen to get very many kilograms to our engine. And correcting for density, we see hydrogen falling behind. Rocket engines care about two things, exhaust velocity in meters per second, the efficiency of the engine, is determined by the exhaust velocity and mass propellant flow in kilograms per second. Multiply these two and we get the force of thrust produced by the engine. Every turbo pump will have a limited size and spin rate. Get too big and the g-forces at the ends of the blades becomes too high. The same if you spin too fast. This will limit the volume of liquid that can be pumped. A denser liquid can use a smaller turbo pump or can spin at a slower rate and still pump the same number of kilograms per second as a larger, faster spinning turbo pump, using a less dense fuel. Once again, a larger blade experiences much greater g-forces for any given rate of rotation than a shorter blade. It also takes power to spin a turbo pump, a lot of power, 55,000 horsepower for the F1 turbo pump. To make this power, we can use the expansion of hydrogen liquid to gas like in the RL-10 expander cycle rocket engine, or from the expansion of methane liquid into gas, like the M10 engine made by the European Space Agency. Only these two liquids, and perhaps ammonia, could work with aerospikes today, by the way. Aerospike rocket engines create a lot of heat. 
This is fine if you are using alloys with a high heat conduction and are cooling them with fuels that have a high heat capacity. The heat from the combustion chamber can pass through the metal and into the fuel, which expands, cooling the engine, and flashes into a gas by the time it starts mixing with the oxidizer in the combustion chamber. Here is the Arcos rocket engine by Pangea. You can see the feed system, modular combustors, aerospike nozzle, and the dual regenerative cooling systems. But other rocket fuels don't expand as much, and while a long chain hydrocarbon can be used to cool a rocket nozzle, they really can't be used very effectively in an expander cycle engine, as the temperature needed to make them a gas would cause them to polymerize. For hydrocarbon rocket fuels, like one using RP-1, we usually power a turbo pump with a pre-burner or gas generator. By burning some of the fuel and oxygen and using the expanding hot gas made of carbon dioxide, water, and unburned fuel or oxidizer to spin a turbine attached by a shaft to a pump. Like the Saturn V F1 engine we spoke about earlier that used refined kerosene with a fuel-rich gas generator. Early rockets used regular kerosene as fuel, but kerosene is not a single type of molecule, like methane or hydrogen. You see the kerosene formula here, and some of these chains are branched instead of linear. Mixed molecules are unpredictable. Very light ones might form bubbles and cavitate. Higher mass molecules or molecules with side branches are prone to forming waxy deposits. Sulfur must be removed from the mix to reduce polymerization. In America, a standardized refined kerosene called Rocket Propellant 1 or RP-1 was developed. RP-1 has an average density of about 810 kilograms per cubic meter. In the Soviet Union, they made slightly different versions called Rocket Grade 1 or RG-1 or T-1. These have slightly higher densities than RP-1 of 820 and 850 kilograms per cubic meter, respectively. The Soviets would sometimes superchill their version of RP-1 to increase density. SpaceX does the same thing today. Here, superchilling RP-1 means about... This is nothing compared to the 20 Kelvin that liquid hydrogen needs, or even the around 70 Kelvin that methane and liquid oxygen are chilled to. RP-1 engines burn at an optimal oxidizer to fuel ratio of around 2.56. This ratio produces a combustion temperature of about 3,670 Kelvin. The pre-burner, or gas generator, will usually run fuel rich, so it doesn't get too hot. The Merlin rocket engine by SpaceX is of this type. Let's take a close look at it. Here we see a gas generator with throttle valves to control them. The exhaust from the gas generator powers this turbine, then goes through this heat exchanger to heat and expand the helium used to pressurize the tanks. While you can use hot oxygen to pressurize an oxygen tank, and hot hydrogen or methane to pressurize their tanks, you can't use hot RP-1 to pressurize RP-1 tanks. Here we see the RP-1 coming from the tank and through the fuel pump. From there, through the fuel trim valve and then the main fuel valve. It helps to cool the nozzle and combustion chamber before going into the injector plate up here. The oxygen comes from this tank through the oxygen pump, through the main oxygen valve, and into the injector plate, with a little going here into the gas generator. This design is again using a fuel-rich gas generator, and by throttling the generator, we can throttle the flow of oxygen and fuel. We can slightly adjust the oxidizer to fuel ratio by trimming the fuel. Some engines run oxygen rich instead of fuel rich, like the RD-180. Here you see that it runs just like the Merlin, with a single shaft turbo pump, which actually feeds two combustion chambers. The gas generator here runs oxidizer rich. This is harder to do and takes special alloys. But running oxygen rich is cleaner than fuel rich and can produce more power for its size. Pumping more propellant increases thrust. And the RD-180 is one of the best RP-1 engines ever made. The blue engine BE-4, like the RD-180, uses an oxygen-rich preburner. And like the F-1, Merlin, and RD-180, uses a single-shaft turbo pump. Here you can see what a single-shaft pump looks like. The BE-4 has just one very large combustion chamber. We have surmised in our analysis of the BE-4 that stress fracturing of the very large turbo pump blades and problems generating enough power in the gas generator without overheating 
have led to the delays this engine has experienced. I have heard that combustion instability may also have been a problem, but I find it unlikely this wasn't solved fairly quickly. Not all rocket engines use a single shaft turbo pump. The RL10 hydrogen fueled engine uses gears, which you can see here, to spin the liquid hydrogen pump at a different rate than the liquid oxygen pump. Some rocket engines have more than one turbo pump. The RS25 rocket engines, now used on the SLS and previously on the space shuttle, had two fuel rich preburners to power the high pressure turbo pumps and use the expander cycle to make two low pressure pumps. Here you see the hydrogen coming down through the low pressure pump, then around the combustion chamber and upper part of the nozzle. Here the liquid hydrogen would be heated and expanded. This would then come up through here to spin the low pressure pump. Then it could go up here to pressurize the external hydrogen tank and also down here to fuel the high pressure hydrogen pump, which would pump hydrogen from the low pressure pump through the high pressure pump and around the hot nozzle. This would cool the nozzle and turn the liquid hydrogen to a gas. This gas would then go up here and out to the two injector plates, where it would be partially burned with a little oxygen brought in here, and this would power the high pressure turbo pumps. And the unburned hydrogen and a little steam would go into the main combustion chamber. Over here, the oxygen comes down through the low pressure pump and goes through this oxidizer heat exchanger. This lets the oxygen here flash from liquid to gas, helping to cool this turbo pump. The hot oxygen can then go here to spin the low pressure oxidizer pump using an expander cycle. And some of it will go up here to pressurize the oxygen tank. Most of it will go this way to combine with the hot hydrogen in the main combustion chamber. And finally, some hot oxygen goes around through here to provide oxidizer to the fuel rich high pressure fuel and oxidizer pumps. This is a very efficient engine and I don't see any reason why this would not work with methane if we adjust the size of the hydrogen pump. Because of hydrogen's low density, the hydrogen high pressure pump had to be much larger than the oxygen. The addition of these low pressure pumps allows you to pump fluids at a higher rate while avoiding cavitation. We could adjust the fuel pump volume for methane and it should work. In fact, adapting this proven design for the Blue Origin BE4 might have been a better idea than trying to use a giant single shaft turbo pump. SpaceX, as we all know, went with full flow stage combustion. All of the oxygen goes through the oxygen preburner, which runs oxygen rich and powers the oxidizer turbo pump. And all of the methane goes through the methane turbo pump, which runs fuel rich and powers the fuel turbo pump. Either of these two efficient designs would almost certainly work with ethane, propane, butane, and on up for a while, but eventually there would be too much coking for reuse. And if you weren't going to reuse the engine, things get simpler. Here is the RS-68, a hydrogen-fueled rocket engine also designed by Rocketdyne. Here is the diagram. This engine uses a gas generator that runs two separate turbo pumps, one for the liquid oxygen and one for the liquid hydrogen. Here is the helium line to spin things up. Here are the valves to release the oxygen and fuel to the gas generator. The exhaust from the gas generator, after going to these two turbo pumps, is dumped overboard. You can exhaust this around the nozzle to keep it cool like the Saturn V F1 and the Merlin engines, but this engine was contracted to reduce the cost from the RS-25s, and it used an ablative line nozzle. This is where a special lining slowly burns away, carrying away the heat and keeping the nozzle from melting. Some turbo pumps have this type of lining too. Here we see a heat exchanger, just before the gas generator exhaust is released. This heats the oxidizer so it can be an energetic gas and keep the liquid oxygen tank pressurized. Here we see a cooling jacket around the combustion chamber. Some of this will go up to pressurize the hydrogen fuel tank, while the rest goes through the injector plate into the combustion chamber to burn with the oxygen coming in here and power the rocket. These engines had a cost of about $20 million each, producing almost 3,000 kilonewtons of thrust in vacuum, more than any Raptor, and much more than the $146 million RS-25 space shuttle main engines, which produce a little less than 2,300 kilonewtons. Why are we throwing away almost $600 million worth of rocket engine per flight, when we could be getting more power out of maybe $100 million worth of RS-68s? To be fair, the RS-25 is more efficient than the RS-68. In vacuum, the RS-25 achieves about 452 seconds of specific impulse, while the RS-68 gets about 412 seconds. 
That's probably the cost of throwing this potential thrust away in an open cycle engine like the RS-68 versus the more efficient staged combustion like the RS-25. Now let's look closer at hydrocarbons. Here once again we see the density of these liquids. And here we can compare their energy density in megajoules per kilogram. Here we can divide megajoules per kilogram by kilograms per cubic meter to get megajoules per cubic meter. Looking at these, we can see why hydrogen is in a class of its own when it comes to energy content per kilogram. But because of its extremely low density, the total energy per cubic meter is not that impressive. When it comes to throwing kilograms out the back and producing tremendous thrust, hydrocarbons can be better than hydrogen. That's one reason why the Saturn V used an RP-1 fueled first stage and saved hydrogen for the second and third stages. To make the first stage of a Saturn V hydrogen fueled, you would need something looking more like the Chrysler Serve. The only rocket that uses hydrogen as a fuel in its first stage today is the Delta IV rocket system. Here is a Delta IV single core next to a Falcon 9. The Falcon 9 is 70 meters tall and 3.7 meters in diameter. The Delta IV is 72 meters tall and 5 meters in diameter. If we cut 10 and 12 meters off the top for the second stages, the fairing of the Delta IV is a little larger than the Falcon 9. We see that the volume of the Falcon 9 would be half of 3.7 is 1.85, squared is 3.42, times pi is 10.75, and times 60 is 645 cubic meters. On the Delta IV, half of 5 is 2.5, squared is 6.25, and times pi is 19.63 times 60 is 1,178 cubic meters. The Delta IV has a lot more volume, but the total mass of a single core Delta IV turns out to be about 250 tons, while the mass of the Falcon 9 is almost 550 tons. The higher density of the RP-1 propellant allows a much higher propellant mass. If the Falcon 9 were expended, it could get 22.8 metric tons to lower Earth orbit. The single core Delta IV can only get about 11.5 metric tons to low Earth orbit. These factors are why the Saturn V was built with an RP-1 first stage and the hydrogen second and third stages. For an RP-1 rocket engine, the optimal oxidizer to fuel ratio is given as 2.56 if the oxidizer density is 1,140 kilograms per cubic meter and the RP-1 density is about 810 kilograms per cubic meter. The SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket supercools the liquid oxygen to about 66 Kelvin, Three, two, getting it down to about 1,250 kilograms per cubic meter, and cools the RP-1 down to about 266 Kelvin, getting a density of around 1,078 kilograms per cubic meter. This adds a lot of RP-1 to the volume of a Falcon 9, compared to an RP-1 rocket that doesn't go this cold. If the oxidizer to fuel ratio is 2.56, this means that for every 2.56 kilograms of liquid oxygen, we need one kilogram of liquid RP-1. Not all rocket engines burn at this ratio, however. I have seen 2.77 as the ratio for the Merlin engine, and 2.27 for the F-1 engines on the Saturn V S-1C first stage. Let's use the numbers for the F-1 since everything is published on it. So 2.27 kilograms of liquid oxygen for every one kilogram of liquid RP-1. If we invert these numbers, we go from kilograms per cubic meter to cubic meters per kilogram. Then we can multiply by the relative oxidizer to fuel ratio and get the relative volume ratio. Now if we add these two together and divide each of these numbers by them, we will get the relative oxidizer to fuel fraction. That comes out to 0.66 to 0.34. So 66% of our RP-1 tank volume should be liquid oxygen, while only 34% would be liquid RP-1. Let's see how that compares to the actual S1C tank volumes. Here's the S1C. We can see immediately that the RP-1 tank is quite a bit smaller than the liquid oxygen tank. Here we see the gallons given as 206,000 and 340,000. Using these numbers and converting them to fractions of the whole, we get 0.62 and 0.38. That's pretty close. SpaceX decided to refurbish and reuse their RP-1 engines. But as these hydrocarbon molecules get bigger, it also becomes harder to generate enough heat and pressure to burn them perfectly. Imperfect combustion produces soot. Soot is described as a powder-like form of amorphous carbon. Soot is always caused by incomplete combustion. SpaceX uses high-pressure nitrogen to clean out their engines now, 
but they had used isopropyl alcohol as a cleaner. However, a small amount of this left over in an engine line caused a Merlin engine to shut down in flight. The rocket went on to successfully deploy its Starlink satellites, as the other eight engines were able to compensate. Now before we go, let's talk about one exotic hydrocarbon rocket fuel. The United States and Soviet Union were always looking for better rocket fuels. One developed in the Soviet Union, and later used in Russia, was called Sintin. Sintin should be called 2-methyl 1223-terracyclopropane. Though sometimes it is called tricyclopropane. Sintin was difficult to make, but compared to RP-1, Sintin had a higher density, lower viscosity, meaning it would flow easier, and a higher specific heat of oxidation. Sintin was used in the Soviet U-2 rocket system from 1982 until 1995. After the fall of the Soviet Union, production of this fuel was halted, and because of the high cost of synthesis, no one has used it since. But people are now trying to find carbon-neutral sources of rocket fuel. This has led to the use of fungi and bacteria to produce hydrocarbon fuels. It turns out that you can feed a bacteria called Streptomyces, plant matter, and they can efficiently produce complex hydrocarbons in high quantities, including the three cyclopropane molecule called Sintin, and even one with seven cyclopropane rings. These would have about 42% more energy per unit volume than RP-1. If production is cost-effective, we might be able to see a rocket burning this amazing fuel fly again, showing that even after all these years, the last chapter has not been written on hydrocarbon rocket fuels. Something to think about. Thanks for listening, and stay safe. At Astro Proterra.